Okay, AP Physics, this is going to be the student workbook uh, exercise 4.g in the circular motion packet. And the scenario goes as follows. We have a toy car. It's released from rest on a smooth track with a loop-de-loop. -loop. The car is released from height H such that it never loses contact with the track. System includes the car and the earth. And it looks like they're going to neglect any rotational effects from the wheels, and friction, and air resistance. All of that can be ignored. And if we look over at the situation, you've got the car up on the top of the ramp. And then it looks like they're going to also have us look at where the car is at the very, very top of the loop-de-loop. -loop. So there's two different situations here. There's one at the very top of the ramp. And then there's like a second snapshot down at the bottom of the ramp and then like up the loop-de-loop. -loop. So we've got uh, option or view one, and then we've got view two. Uh, for part A, it says draw and label free body diagrams on the figure shown above that depicts the forces, not the components, exerted on the car as it goes down the ramp and at the top of the loop. Draw the relative lengths of all the vectors to reflect the relative magnitudes of all the forces. Each force must be represented by a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the car. So similar to how you would draw free body diagrams, except they're just not dots. So let's do with the car at the top of the ramp first, and let's see what forces we have acting on it. We know that it's on a ramp, so there's going to be a normal force acting on it. So I'm going to draw a force that's 90 degrees to the surface, and then we're going to label that force. And then we also know that this car is going to get pulled down by the force of gravity. We know that gravity points straight down, so we're going to draw a second arrow, and we're going to label that force as well. You could use MG, you could use FG, um, either one of those are perfectly fine. And let's see, and I think those are the only two forces. There's no friction acting on this, so we don't have to worry about the force of friction pulling it back. Uh, don't write that one in there. Let's look at the forces down at the bottom at the top of the loop-de-loop -loop and see what we've got. At the top of the loop-de-loop, -loop, we know that gravity is still pulling down. We also know that gravity doesn't change, so we're going to draw the exact same length of the arrow. Make sure that you mark that MG. There's also a normal force acting on it as well too, as long as this car is going to make it across the loop-de-loop -loop and go back around. And that normal force is going to still be present on the car. So the surface is still pushing the car, keeping it in that circular motion. Um, but it's not going to be as large of a force, so make sure that the arrow for the normal force is not as long. These are really easy ways to get points on the AP Physics exam is by drawing the force arrows where they ask you to, uh, but it's also a really easy place to miss points as well, too, if you don't pay attention to the length of the arrows. Uh, they're not looking for specific numbers, they're just looking for the actual just relative sizes. So we've got four forces, you know, MG and N, uh, two on the left, two on the right, and there's nothing in between, no, no additional forces there. And if we look at part B, it says um, fill in the energy bar chart below with the internal energy when the car is first released from a height H and the final energy when the car is released, or sorry, when the car is at the top of the loop-de-loop. -loop. So we've got our Cuggis chart. So you got K, UG, and US. K for kinetic energy, UG for gravitational potential energy, and US for spring potential energy. There are no springs in this problem, so go ahead and just put a zero for the spring potential energy, it's not there. Uh, there's literally no springs in the problem, so don't include it. At the very top of the hill, uh, the car isn't really moving at first. It's gonna start to gain speed, but it hasn't really started moving yet. So for the kinetic energy, put a zero. At the top of the hill, it's all kinetic energy. So go ahead and just make a bar that's really full up to the top. It doesn't matter how many squares you use yet but it does make a difference on the other side. Um, on, for the final energy, let's see, there's no spring potential energy. Uh, it went up the loop-de-loop, -loop, so there is still some gravitational potential energy, and there's going to be less kinetic energy, or the, we're actually going to have kinetic energy, but it's not going to be as large. So we're going to draw a bar to show that we still have some potential energy like so and then we're also going to say but there's also a little bit of kinetic energy as well too and you need to make them relative enough that if you add the two bars together 
the two bars added together should come out to be about the size of your gravitational potential energy on the left side. I always fill out the charts to where every bar has something written on it. So you can notice down at the bottom how I, even though there was no spring potential energy, I went ahead and I put something there. Uh, even though there was no kinetic energy, I went ahead and just drew like a flat line to show that there's nothing there. That's a good way to show the graders that like, you know, that there's no energy involved there. So I would go ahead and do that. That would be good practice. All right, so for the next part, uh, let's see. We have, get down there. Uh, citing the bar chart, explain why the release height must be greater than the diameter of the loop. So this one deals with explanations, and you guys know that I, I really think it's very important that you write your own answers. So I'm going to give you a couple of pointers to go with here. Uh, pay attention to the Cuggis chart, um, and think about like what would happen if you... Um, moved a, let's see, let's, let's think about this, um, the gravitational potential energy up on this side, think about what would happen if you tried to release this uh, from a distance that was lower than the diameter of the loop. Uh, you wouldn't have enough gravitational potential energy to make it over to the top. It would just move up halfway and then fall back down. So pay attention, and whenever you try to explain what's happening, try to use your Cuggis chart. So talk about your kinetic energy at the beginning, and then talk about your gravitational potential energy at the beginning, and how they're going to trade over. So talk about that trade-off between the kinetic energy and then the potential energy. Uh, also try to remember that kinetic energy is going to be equal to one half mv squared. So keep in mind that if you've got a um, kinetic energy, there's going to be a velocity involved as well too. Okay, so talk about that trade-off between that kinetic and potential energy, and you'll do pretty well on that one. It's uh, That one's pretty self-explanatory and not too terribly bad. Um, let's see here. For the next one. All right, data analysis. This is where things start to get a little bit interesting. Uh, for part D, it says Carlos determines that the normal force the car experiences at the top of the loop can be determined by the equation uh, Fn equals 2mg over h. To test the equation, he releases the cart from various heights and records the normal force at the top of the loop from the sensor in the track. Uh, the graph below is student's plot of the data for Fn as a function of height. Okay, so um, it's important to note that the equation up at the top, this 2mg over h, this is something that Carlos made up. So this is something that he came up with theoretically and said, hey, I think that this is the relationship that this is going to work with. And then it's also important to note that whenever we make a chart of all of the data, uh, this is actual data. So this is stuff that he went out, he measured, and he saw, hey, this is the relationship of what happens to the normal force as the height changes. Okay, so this is some data that he actually did, and the top part is more of a theoretical calculation. Okay, and then what they want us to do in this one is they want us to compare the two. They want us to compare the equation up at the top, and then they want us to compare the data down at the bottom. And it says, is this data consistent with Carlos's equation? And then we need to explain our reasoning. So let's take a look at the equation, and then let's take a look at the data as well, too. Uh, when I look at the equation, I see that we have a couple of things here. Uh, there is a mg up at the top, and let's think about what actually changes there. Uh, so, well, Okay, the number two doesn't really change. Uh, the mass of the car is a constant value, and gravity, acceleration due to gravity, uh, is also, as long as you're close to the surface of the Earth, these are going to be constant values. So that top part of the equation really doesn't change that much, which means that the relationship that Carlos is trying to show here is the relationship between the normal force and how like the, the height that he drops it from uh, at the beginning of the ramp. Because if we look back at the picture, the letter H stands for how high they drop the car from the very beginning. It doesn't represent the height of the loop-de-loop. -loop. Uh, the loop-de-loop -loop is a fixed value and it doesn't change. So what he's trying to show here is the relationship between the normal force and how high the car is at the very beginning of the drop. 
So that comes out with this data. Now let's look at the data and let's see what happens. Um, we have, let's see if I can try to like draw a straight line because this data looks linear. This looks like roughly a straight line. So I'm going to try my best to just kind of cover all the points as closely as I can without using a ruler. There we go. So it kind of makes this straight line data. Well, let's go back and look at the top. So uh, is this consistent with Carlos's equation? Um, well, I, I would actually probably say not really, uh, because if you look at what he's trying to compare, he's trying to compare the height at the bottom. Uh, I'm sorry, he's trying to compare the height, but the height is in the denominator, which means that this is going to kind of work backwards from what he was thinking. Um, if you have the H in the bottom, that's an inverse relationship. And that inverse relationship will mean that as you decrease the height, then the normal force will actually increase, which is not what we're seeing here. We're seeing here as the, as the height uh, increases, the normal force also increases with it. So we're kind of seeing uh, an, an effect that's opposite of what Carlos was saying. Okay, so um, for this one, wherever you try to explain your reasoning, I would definitely say pay attention to the H whenever you try to give your explanation. Because that H is going to be very, very important inside the equation itself. So if you try to address that, that's going to make your life uh, much more easy. Also, uh, make sure that how that H relates to the normal force. Okay, so you're looking for that relationship between the height and the normal force and how it relates to that graph. It doesn't look like it's going to work out. Um, also, you can try to mention as well, um, the slope of this, and you can say that according to the data, you know, by the data that actually exists, as the um, height goes up, the normal force also increases, which is not what you see from the equation. So by the equation, you have as the um, height goes up, since you're dividing by a larger number, the normal force would go down. And this is not really what we see in the in the problem. So uh, keep that in mind whenever you give your explanation. Try to put it in words. You know, try to come up with sentences to describe it. It's always the hardest part to try to explain your reasoning. But I don't want to just write it out for you because if I write it out for you, then you'll just write down what I write and you won't actually think about it. So give it a thought and let's move on to the next one. Part E says Blake suggests that regardless of whether or not the data above are consistent with the equation, the equation could be incorrect for other reasons. Does the equation make physical sense? Okay, well, let's look back up here. It says uh, the normal force is 2mg over h according to this. So I'm going to write that over to the side. Fn equals 2mg over h. This is Carlos's theoretical equation. Uh, let's look at the units and see this first. The, the first thing that I normally try to do if, if it says that does the equation make physical sense uh, is I want to try to look at the units and see if that actually makes sense. Uh, the mass is in kilograms, so I'm going to just go ahead and write down kilograms. I'm ignoring the 2 because it's just a 2. Uh, acceleration due to gravity is in meters per second squared. And then whenever I divide by the height, the height is also going to be measured in meters. This is going to give some cancellation. So the masses are going to cancel, which is going to leave you with like kilograms per second squared. And that's not, it's wanting it to be equal to Newton's. And it's its not, it's not equal to Newton's. So one of the things is uh, pay attention to the uh, dimensional analysis because I don't think that's going to work out. Or the units, another way to say that is just look at the units and see if the units actually match up. Um, another thing to say is like, does this equation actually make physical sense is pay attention to what happens on the graph itself. So on the graph itself, there is a slope that decreases and goes down to where there is a, uh, should be some like kind of y intercept because if this line were to continue this line would eventually go down and it would cross the y intercept at some location uh, but if you look at the equation that carlos gave there's no number for a y intercept so if you were to try to give a y intercept for this equation it would have to be like plus some kind of number over here some constant value uh, in order to add that y intercept and and it doesn't exist so uh, i would say that another reason why it wouldn't 
really make a whole lot of sense is pay attention to the y-intercept. Also, he's looking for a direct relationship. So uh, direct relationships normally start at the origin at 0, 0. So another question to ask yourself is, uh, does it start at the origin, which would be 0, 0? Uh, so there's kind of three cases as to why this really wouldn't work out. Um, and the more reasons you give, if this was an open response question on the AP exam, the more reasons you give, the, the better off you're going to be. All right, and last but not least, let's go down to uh, part F. Yeah, here we go. What would happen if Carlos released the car from a height of 0.8 meters? Okay, so, well, let's see here, 0.8 meters. Let's go back and look at the actual data. So I know for this one, whenever it says 0.8 meters, it's really important to ignore the equation that Carlos came up with because the equation that Carlos came up with is theoretical, and we've already concluded in the previous two that it didn't really make that much sense. However, the actual data does make a lot of sense. So there's a critical point here where the normal force will become zero at a height of one meter. So uh, if you drop it from anywhere above one meter, then it's going to have a normal force. If you drop it anywhere below one meter, it looks like that normal force just goes away. Now, it wouldn't make sense for there to be a negative normal force. So this, this graph ends whenever you get to zero. So there really shouldn't be like a y-intercept. It should just go to zero, zero. Uh, however, you know, we could, we could modify this graph to just say that you know, we can change and alter the gravitational potential energy locations or the height locations to kind of make it a zero zero direct relationship. But that's not the point. The point is, if you get to a height of one, that's your critical number. And if they're asking about 0.8, well, 0.8 would be about like right here in this location. And that's below where the normal force would actually show up. So that means that there wouldn't be a normal force. And if there's no normal force, then it's not keeping you in a circle. And if it's not keeping you in a circle, then that car is going to fall off the loop-de-loop. -loop. So let's head back down here and let's say what's going to happen here. The car completes the loop or the car does not complete the loop. Since we didn't make it to the appropriate height, I'm going to say that the car does not complete the loop. So the things that you need to think about uh, is to pay attention to the data. Okay, pay attention to the data. Uh, there's a critical point at one meter for H. So describe how that actually changes and you just describe like why that makes a difference. Okay, and with this one, the more you try to describe with it, the, the better off it's going to be. Um, try to describe like, you know, uh, Let's just a couple of key things like, you know, what happens uh, when the height is going to be equal to one? Like just describe in a sentence what happens when the height is equal to one. Uh, then describe what happens, use the ditto marks, what happens when the H is equal to, oh, uh, not equal to, I'm sorry, what happens when the H is greater than one? And then you can also describe, you know, what happens when h is less than one and if you can describe all three of these cases then you can very easily describe what happens whenever the car is released from a height of 0.8 meters so uh, i think we made it all the way through that was part a b c d e and f so i hope this was helpful to you guys and i'll talk at you later